Hello lovelies. I know my videos have tended to run long <laughs> lately, but the t subjects that I've been tackling have been things that you can't really sum up in a five or, or ten minute video very easily. And I don't tend to script very often because I prefer these videos to have kind of authenticity, um, off, the, off the cuff feel to them, uh, a, a genuine sense to them of what I'm thinking as I'm thinking it, the, the process that goes into it. So that's another reason that things tend to run long. If you prefer things shorter and less bloviating, then uh, go and watch Logan Paul fuck a squirrel or something. I, I don't know. But today is going to be no exception. Uh, this is going to be a political video. I'm going to try and keep it non-partisan because I think the issues that it raises are non-partisan and I'm trying to draw together all kinds of different threads of thought that I have been having and basically I think that Western democracy as it exists is no longer fit for purpose and I'm not advocating for anything other than democracy per se I'm just trying to point out the issues that we're having and why we're having them and maybe we can find some solutions along the way. Our democracies and perhaps even our societies are no longer fit for purpose and this really perhaps shouldn't surprise us given that the institutions that we hold so dear were invented in the time of the horse and carriage when post took days or weeks to get from one person to another when the majority of people were illiterate and uninformed and it's been a bodge job since day one trying to figure out some sort of compromise between all the different tugs and pushes in different areas of society so it really shouldn't surprise us that because we haven't really changed anything and here I'm primarily talking about the UK and the US that it doesn't really work in the age of computers and robotic workers and information technology and the internet and the YouTubes and everything else. It, it really shouldn't surprise us that it doesn't work anymore the way it was supposed to. But the trouble is that the critiques of the way that we do things that many people adhere to, such as Marxism, for example, are also out of date and fundamentally unsuited to judging, criticizing or examining the world in which we find ourselves as well. I mean, Marxism, the idea of viewing the world, the way we structure society in terms of class, there's still insights to be found there. The, the core idea is okay, but we don't live in a world of a, a mass industrial working class anymore. In the developed West, we don't really make things anymore. There aren't enough workers to get enough weight behind them to be meaningful enough to their employers to be able to collectivize and threaten their employers in order to get better working conditions, fairer pay, or any of the rest of it. People are lucky to have jobs at all if they're relatively uneducated and, and so forth and so there's there's little threat little risk to the status quo coming from that kind of analysis that just doesn't work either and that's probably why most people are concentrating on the dwindling middle class with their political messaging and so on but what we have is failing badly and brexit and trump if they have a silver lining, it is that they have underlined all these fractures and problems and breaking points in our societies, in our democracies, and shown us where we need to tackle them. And indeed, that is a big part of the reason that a lot of people voted for Trump, less, less so for Brexit. If they couldn't get what they really wanted, Bernie Sanders, and an actual alternative, to the status quo, if they couldn't get that, then why not just flip the table, hope enough stuff breaks that you can put it back together in a way that you prefer. 
and yet that isn't understood by a lot of people when you've got nothing to lose you may as well smash it all up and start over our leaders and sometimes quite often this is our fault are not fit for purpose they've forgotten how to lead and on the few occasions where they have stepped forth and made an important leadership decision they have made completely the wrong decision if you look at our politicians today they just don't have that sense of, of leadership they don't try to convince us of, of their point of view they try to hedge and fumble and try to please everybody rather than trying to win over the people that disagree with them rather than trying to lead or or educate i mean can you imagine the flawed but great leaders of our history being in a position of leadership today do you think churchill would even possibly end up a political leader in in this day and age with his rambunctiousness with his florid speech with his insults and his incivility <laughs> and his my way or the highway approach and yet history records that he was right more often than not he was wrong on some things not altogether a thoroughly nice chap but he was at least a leader you can bear that to today and people do mistake populism for leadership trump isn't a leader he's a windsock he goes wherever his base points basically that's that's not leadership people will often mistake it for leadership but the people leading trump it's one third of the american electorate who are particularly vocal and who don't really uh, understand or grasp the nuances for the most part of what goes on in the world he's a populist not a leader nigel farage for all he still is on the fringes of british politics for all the airtime that he gets he's a, a populist he doesn't believe what comes out of his mouth he's just saying what will please a certain demographic of activated voters that they yeah that that's it people who are incensed about maybe one or two issues to the point where nothing else matters and he feeds them red meat all the while benefiting from the very things that he is going to dismantle in his attempt at populism even in comparison to today if we look back to tony blair or barack obama you know these were people who in their time were championed as good leaders but they didn't really do much of anything barack failed to deliver on all the things that he was pronouncing upon in his speeches at the stump blair was wildly popular in his time but the one time he exercised actual leadership he took us into a deeply unpopular war and destroyed labor's legacy though he already had by moving it towards the center ground some would say i would certainly say so we have leaders but no leadership no vision nothing to really get our teeth into nobody to step forward and show a way into the future nobody with a, a vision for the future just a bumbling along and going this way or that according to the public whims and yes we are democracies but we do also need leadership this isn't an appeal for strong man leadership look where that gets us but we do still need leaders persuasive charismatic intelligent educated people in other words not politicians one of the most important predicates upon which the idea of democracy is based is the idea of an informed populace 
Now, in the past, the franchise was restricted for various reasons. You know, women were considered too emotional to be allowed to vote. The poor were considered to be uninformed and uninvolved in what was going on. These were obviously <laughs> bad ideas uh, rooted in prejudice, but there's also a kernel of truth in there somewhere. Women didn't used to be educated in the way that men were. Poor people didn't used to have access to education. They weren't literate. They couldn't read papers. So aside from the prejudice, there were reasons, valid reasons, to exclude certain portions of the populace from engagement in the political process, from voting from the franchise you know that being that they were too ignorant to really have any meaningful say on what was going on i am describing this situation i am not condoning it just so you know that melted away as society industrialized as public education became a thing as literacy rates rose people became more invested in the politics that was going on around them. They became interested, they became educated, they became informed, and they wanted their say, and they fought for it, and they got it one way or another. And there's an old saying, you may not care about politics, but politics cares about you. And that holds true, whether you're engaged or not, the political machine moves on and that shifts the economics, the laws, the social atmosphere, everything that we're in. It can affect what you do for a living, it can affect what you do for leisure, it can affect the food you eat, the water you drink, everything else. Politics cares about you, so if you don't care about politics, you're a bit of a sucker, as far as I'm concerned. So an informed populace is important. Is the populace informed? More people are better educated today than ever before. Public education is available to pretty much everyone unless they elect to take themselves out of it. So people should be engaged. We have mass media, we have the internet, all these forms of communication. The knowledge of the world is at your fingertips. And yet, Possibly, we have a less well-informed populace than at any time prior in history since we've had public education and universal literacy. So, why is that? Well, I think it's important to distinguish between ignorance and stupidity. There are plenty of intelligent people who are ignorant, and there are plenty of people who are knowledgeable but stupid. One is no guarantee of the other at all. And all of these things that should be helping us to make informed political decisions when we vote, or however else we engage in the political process, they've actually made things worse. People are wildly politically illiterate, People are in echo chambers of their own making or echo prisons of other people's making. How often on Facebook or other social media do you see someone say, if you don't agree with me on position X on issue Y, then unfollow me? Or how often have you been blocked for even having a, a mild disagreement with someone over something political? To have a nuanced view in this febrile atmosphere that the internet and you know, partisan mass media has created. To have a nuanced view is to have no political home whatsoever. It's, it's to have no tribe. You know, I am way firmly on the left, and yet not a day goes by when someone doesn't accuse me of being right-wing or reactionary or whatever else. 
Now, I have a disadvantage in these conversations in that I actually have a political and historical education. I know what these terms mean. I know how things have unfolded in the past. Usually that leads to me arguing with right-wingers, particularly about the definition of socialism. Yesterday was something of an exception. I got to argue with Marxists about the definition of socialism. I have other videos on that. I won't go into it here. But the, the point is, even people who are politically engaged, people who want a revolution, people who want to overturn society, are politically illiterate. The news serves us up what we want to hear, what not what we need to hear. You either watch Fox or you watch MSNBC. You either watch Molyneux or the Young Turks. You know, you, you read Breitbart or who the fuck knows what on the left. And you don't get to see what the other people think except in the context of it being presented to you as them being outrageously horrible. And to be fair, a lot of people on all sides are outrageously horrible. Echo chambers is one thing. You know, you're self-selecting to put yourself into a closed group. Echo prisons is another. That's when other people block you and you end up through no fault of your own being locked in a room with people who agree with you and this is a big part of why things have gotten so partisan that and the, and the mass media the, the fox news effect the daily mail effect these echo chambers and echo prisons well, we know from psychological studies that if people are in a group that all essentially agrees on a point, they will tend to trend towards the more extreme point of view present in that group, because they all agree and no one wants to step out of line and disagree even slightly. And we're in a situation now where to disagree even slightly is to be a Nazi or a Marxist, or both, simultaneously, Schrodinger's political football. <laughs> the populace is not informed, it is misinformed. Conspiracy theories and nonsense have an appeal because you like to feel that you're the one in the know. You have the real skinny. You really understand what's going down. And that's how you get things like Pizzagate or 9-11 conspiracy theories or cultural Marxism or <laughs> whatever else. Which is a real thing. It's just been misinterpreted and reinterpreted into a conspiracy theory. So we have a problem. How do you inform a populace that chooses not to be informed, that chooses to be misinformed, that chooses only to get a single point of view that already agrees with them? And that seems to be an insoluble problem. And a lot of it comes from the algorithms, from mathematical robots serving us up things that we want to see, things that we already agree with, because we're more likely to respond positively to them and more likely to watch them. It's an economy of attention that is slowly poisoning us and our society. Another problem that we have is that everybody is now living the kind of life that a celebrity once did. You have no privacy, you have no right to privacy. If you want to garner the full advantages of engagement on social media and everything else, then you have to give up your right to privacy. And there's a permanent record of everything you say, no matter how drunk, no matter how stoned, no matter how angry or bitter or heartbroken you are. If you make a comment on the internet, it's pretty much there forever and someone can find it. And we have, as a result, no private lives. Companies will fire you for something that you have said, even in private, to a friend or supposed friend on social media. Every statement that you make, if someone decides that you're politically inconvenient, every statement that you make, everything you've done, Every piece of work, every piece of writing, every blog post, every Instagram photograph, everything will be picked over for signs of wrong think. And this happens on both sides of the political spectrum. And both sides are outraged when the other side gets someone fired for something they've said and overjoyed when their side gets someone fired for something they've said. 
this, this this is no way to live. We need a delineation between our public and private lives. And just because we're living our private lives publicly doesn't mean that there can't be lines between our personal life and our professional life. And nobody should be fired. I mean, who cares if your coffee server is a Nazi or a tanky so long as they don't bring it up while they're serving you coffee. Yeah, who who gives a fuck? What difference does it make? None whatsoever. Some people are lucky they can get away with it due to projecting their personality and charisma online. They can be snarky, they can be mean, and it doesn't impact on them. I'm thinking they're like the, the White Moose Cafe in, in Ireland that did pretty well out of being aggressively mean to vegans, but then who likes vegans? But you get my point. There is no private life anymore, and all it takes is one indiscretion at some point in your life, in your career online, and you can be ruined. Even an accusation. I mean, we have people with accusations of sexual impropriety made in a tweet or two and losing their careers, and in some cases their lives, as a result. When it's just an accusation, it's it's a couple of tweets. It's nothing more than that. So the rule of law is being eroded, let alone anything else. And this social panopticon that we've created, where everybody is sitting in constant judgment on everybody else, is far more insidious and nasty than the 1984-style surveillance that is also going on. Frankly, the government is the least of our problems when it comes to surveillance. It's our... It's our friends and family who inform on us to the mob. And then you're fucked. We're in a state of permanent revolution. Not in the Trotskyist sense of permanent revolution, but a permanent state of technological revolution. The white heat of science and technology is burning up everything. And our institutions, our legal institutions, our political institutions, our policing, law, governance of all kinds is failing to keep up. And normally the slow state of adaptation and change in political systems is something of an advantage. It helps prevent radical and destructive change. But in this current paradigm, this, this current context in which we find ourselves, it's a massive disadvantage because our institutions, our democracies, are not agile enough to respond to changes in the modern world. I mean, consider that a teenager sending a, a saucy selfie to another teenager can be arrested, tried, charged, and jailed for spreading child pornography a picture of themselves sent to another teenager and both of them can be of the age of sexual consent and still get screwed over by it because the pornography laws are often higher age limits than the time when you're allowed to have sex in the UK for example you must be 18 to appear in a, a porn shoot or porn spread or whatever but the age of consent is 16 technology has not kept up. We see similar problems elsewhere. I mean, the whole Cambridge Analytica thing and the surprisingly small amount of fuss that was actually made about it or the cheating of the Leave campaign or the hacking and interference in the American election. People seem to be happy so long as they get what they wanted out of it and all the principles of democracy and so on seem to have evaporated like ghosts into mist. None of it makes any sense. And these are just the early shocks to our society brought about by the internet. You know, the bubbles that I talked about. We're on the verge of more changes and revolutions, which are far more fundamental. I mean, we already had automation and robotics to an extent throwing a great amount of manual workers and industrial laborers out of jobs. 
removing us uh, or removing ourselves from using coal as a main power source had massive societal effects particularly here in the UK and now we're on the verge of the maker revolution of automation stepping out of the car factories and into the fast food restaurants and all these other areas of life it's hard to think of a job that can't conceivably be under threat by artificial intelligence or even true artificial intelligence if we ever crack that particular problem and so i mean in the in a lot of western nations we weren't able to get our native populations to do jobs particular jobs like fruit picking or cleaning toilets or janitorial services or so on so we compensated for our aging population and our lack of people willing to do the work by bringing people in and now those jobs are going to be replaced by automation and what then what are all these people going to do with their lives we've defined ourselves by what we do since we stopped being hunter gatherers you know our job has been a huge part of our identity and now that's going to be disappearing for a huge number of people how are we going to define ourselves? How are we going to find our, our sense of worth, our sense of value, our sense of identity and individuality if it's not, at least in part, what we do? What's going to happen there? Is the democratization of the capability of, of building things, of industrialization, is the individuation of industrialization going to have as profound an effect as the individuation of information has had? probably you know makers fabbers things like that are going to bring the factory into the home in a corner in a box like a microwave or a device in your garage even gardening and farming is being roboticized what are all these people going to do who are they going to be what is this going to do to our societies how are we going to cope are the rich going to be willing to roll over and offer up more of their income, more of their wealth, to a system of greater and greater social largesse of basic income? Or are they going to resist it with everything that they've got? And then what's going to happen to all these people being left behind? Are we just going to let them starve in the street like it's Dickensian London or something? what what do we do you know these these are big questions that we have no real answers for and even people who are trying to tackle this philosophically scientifically sociologically governments aren't tackling it at all aren't really thinking about it at all outside of a few edge case experiments as they can say that they had which they then go on to ignore this is just the beginning of the upheavals that we're facing and these coming upheavals are going to be far more profound and far-reaching and given the problems that we're already facing just just tackling information technology i dread to think how bad things are going to get South Park on multiple occasions has famously decried the political choices which we are given as choosing between a douche and a turd sandwich. Not perhaps the best example because douches have an actual use, whereas turd sandwiches really don't. But you get the point. The choices that we're presented don't feel like choices. Our governments are unresponsive, unrepresentative. Often there's very little to choose between the two. And yet there's this hunger for change and difference, something new and overturning the old order. I mean, that's what got Obama elected, the, the promise of hope and of change. And he singularly failed to deliver on that. For all he was an erudite, urbane, charismatic and well-spoken man, he did not deliver on what he promised. And that made a lot of people very embittered disenchanted and disenfranchised and now we have trump and in many ways he is a result of obama 
and the way in which what passes for the American left has, has acted in recent years, in much the same way that Obama was a reaction to W and so forth. But with the choice that we are being presented with, both in the US and, the, and in the UK, is, okay, you can have cultural libertarianism, but only if we take away all of the, yeah, the social security and largesse and, and the, the, the things that make life livable. You can have freedom to say what you want, but we're going to take away everything that helps you stay alive, fed, <laughs> sheltered, warm. You know, all of those things. We'll take those away, but you can say what you want. Or on the other side, we're going to say, OK, we will give you what you need or more of what you need. But in exchange, we're going to take away your right to say and think and express what you like. And even that's a false choice because the right wing only says that it supports free speech to the extent that it allows them to say what they want. They're happy to silence other people's free speech. And the left is equally schizophrenic on this. I mean, prime example, look at Sadiq Khan. He pronounced that the allowing the Trump baby balloon to fly just demonstrated Britain's commitment to free speech. This from the same guy who took it upon himself to ban beach body ready adverts of a woman in a bikini from the London Underground. I mean, total lack of self-awareness and hypocrisy. So if, if you want to be able to say and think and do largely what you want, but you think that society should take care of its members, you've got no choice. There's nobody offering that, nobody worth a spit anyway. And part of this is the problems in our political systems, again, particularly in the US and UK, though more representative, proportional representation systems in other European countries have their own issues. But how different would our political landscape be if people could vote for who they really wanted and if the public's views were really represented? And yet you look at something like the, the recent plebiscite on European membership in, in the UK and you see all this corruption, you see the overspend, the multiple breaches of electoral law, and nobody gives a shit. So maybe more representative isn't a good idea. I tend to think that it is. And then there's the question over whether what's going on is actually representative of the votes that have happened either the, 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 every, everything is screwed we have a systemic and total failure it's not just someone's got appendicitis they've got appendicitis and pneumonia and their kidneys are packing up and they've got gangrene in one of their legs it's it's a total systemic failure solving any single one problem will not solve the whole overall holistic problem and I don't know that we can solve it, at least not without some major social upheaval, but I don't want this to just be a bummer. What, what can we do? I mean, our political system is so out of touch and detached from people that it may as well not exist, at least so far as our individual desires go. Society is mean, nasty, we, ha we have no private lives, protest doesn't work, you can march in the streets all you like and it doesn't make any difference anymore. I mean we're well past the point that people should be rioting like, like they did over the poll tax riots, and yet even if they did that probably wouldn't change anything. The traditional weapon of the completely disenfranchised, terrorism, will get you nowhere. There's basically, it feels like there's nothing we can do. We can't change our political system. We can't change politicians. We can only choose the least evil that we are presented with. So it feels kind of hopeless, doesn't it? Like we're staring down the barrel of a gun. I don't think it necessarily is hopeless. I think we can make change because any movement is made up of individuals and if we each individually choose to start compensating for some of these problems 
then the politics doesn't necessarily matter. Get involved in single causes that you care about and spread information, give them a bit of spare change, whatever you can for that individual cause that you care about. That's going to be far more effective and focused than fixating your attention on a political party will be. In your individual relationships, try being a bit more forgiving, a bit more understanding. Try to understand the other person's point of view. Try to expose yourself to the other person's point of view. If you only ever watch Fox, spend one day a week watching MSNBC or, or something. If you only ever read the Daily Mail, once a week treat yourself to a copy of The Guardian or something. You don't have to agree, you just have to expose yourself to other people's points of view. And being forgiving, being kind, I think that's that's a big thing that we can each individually do. Not everyone you engage with is your enemy. Not everyone is stupid. And you will fail at this. God knows I fail all the time. But I try to be understanding and kind and to let people give the, the best case for their ideas that they can. I fail all the time, but at least I try. And if we understand that people fail even when they try yeah that's that's a big thing if you find yourself on jury duty for someone like a teenager who's been arrested for sending a sext or someone who's been found with a bunch of pot or whatever else say they're not guilty even if they are be an activist juror because that way at least even if we can't change the law we can choose not to implement it by being activist jurors. This isn't something I believe someone should be jailed for, so I'm finding this person not guilty. Yeah, we, we can do things individually, and if enough individuals choose to move in a certain direction, then that's a movement. That's a mass movement. There is no true divide between collectivism and individualism. A collective is just a group of individuals all moving in the same direction. That, that's all it is. So if enough of us make enough small individual actions to be kind, be nice, to spread information, to expose ourselves to other points of view, to make moral and ethical choices, then we can change the world just a little bit regardless of how unresponsive and horrible our political and social systems are and how maladapted they are to the way things currently are. And if we keep that up long enough, they'll catch up. Zang. Everyone's so ordinary They watch the world with blind eyes